good morning to all of you. And it's a special treat for me to really be home in so many ways. Uh, good Shepherd has always been my home and it still remains so today. <clears throat> there are a lot of people I could thank uh, for making Good Shepherd while I was here a true home and a true community. But I want to highlight again two people. Um, Lou Cutell, where are you, Lou? Is, stand, Lou, stand up. Jim Wilson, I know Jim is here. Okay, Lou, you can, you can continue to stand, that's okay. Stand up. I will tell you that the Lord has blessed Good Shepherd in so many ways, and without the Lord's grace and without the Lord's presence, we wouldn't be here today. I had some hand in that, but I had two great partners in ministry, and the three of us were a great team, and I am so grateful for the work that they did, have done, and continue to do today. So and in many ways, I want to applaud them for being here this morning. I'd like to begin by having us read together a portion of the text that I'll be using for my message this morning. If we'll read it together, please. From John 12, If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. That'll serve as part of the background for the message that I'm going to share with you this morning, and it's entitled, Be Courageous. Now, I'd like to set the scene for this by asking a question, and the question is this. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus today? The question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus today? And this has been a real struggle in my own life. Now, you'd say as a pastor, you ought to be able to have an idea of what that is. And all the basics, yes, I fully understand. But the bigger question is how do you serve and become a disciple in the world we live today? And what do disciples really do today? Tough questions. And so I'd like to begin by at least talking about the basic problem we face most of this you know very, very well. The first is that there are elements of change everywhere in the world. We see it happening and it's almost as though there is a darkness descending on our world, whether it's in our own lives, in our homes, in our communities, in our country. All we hear about these days are corruption, fires, wars, arguments, you can fill in the blanks as well as I can. Keep that in mind. We live in a world that's more dark than light. It's not the first time this has happened in history, but one of the first times it's happened to all of us in the way it's unfolding today. The second thing that I've come to understand over the years, I don't know what the term Christian means anymore. A lot of people use it. It's like organic. You stamp it on something, and who knows what's underneath. Today, we have Republican Christians. We have Democrat Christians. Uh, we have Catholic Christians. We have Baptist Christians. We have Lutheran Christians. We have Christians from the North, Christians from the South, Christians from the East, Christians from the West. And I'm not saying any are or are not. That's for the Lord to decide. But I also know at the same time, when Jesus meets them, the only one who can say, I'm a Christian, is one who can say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus knows them by face. And also, I would say, in too many places, the influence of the Christian community is almost nil. Just mention the name of Jesus and watch what happens. Uh, I've had this happen to me. 
You mention the name, watch the response, and it's usually he and you are not welcome. And it comes in all sizes, shapes, and forms. And for many today, there is no moral anchor or moral compass by which people live. It's on any given day, it's how they feel. What are the circumstances? And then I'll decide what the right thing is to do. By and large, our societal moral foundation is crumbling before our very eyes. We live in a world that has been functionally divorced from the sacred, and the secular has subsumed the sacred. Now, you can say, Sig, I didn't come to you. I mean, I get all that stuff. But I want to say there is also light in the world. And as I have had the privilege of traveling in a lot of places in the world, one of the things I have discovered, there are more and more people who are dissatisfied with the way things are today, an emptiness in their own hearts, an emptiness in their families, an emptiness at work. And they're seeking something to fill that emptiness. Uh, I'd call it good news. The question for us as a challenge, as a Christian community, how do we reach those people? And most of them want nothing to do with Christianity for various reasons. I would call and say it's time for a new wine and new wine skins. We need the courage to face the realities of today, the humility to know God's leading, and the ability to discern the truth about ourselves and the world we live in. Many of you know that for the past 30 years, I've lived in the business and technical world, both here in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. And I must tell you, the experiences were quite enlightening. Let me go back to 1998. I was a student at the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. And I must say that in an unusual way, while there, I began to experience discipleship from an entirely different perspective. Let me briefly share a story. It's about Razak Dawood, Abdul Razak Dawood. At the business school, we lived in quads. Our bedrooms were small, so we could sleep and shower, but you had to come to the center of four of these bedroom sections uh, to get together, to talk, to study. And there were four of us, and then we paired off for a study mate, and my study mate was Razak Dawood. And Razak was the owner of a major engineering firm in Pakistan. And one day, a few weeks into the program, or maybe a month into the program, he said, Sig, I want to go to a football game. So we went over to Harvard Stadium and watched Harvard play, I don't know who. We sat up in the stands and we began to talk. We talked about all kinds of things. And in, he began by talking about the Hajj, his journey to Mecca with his family, not once but twice, and why that was important to him. I didn't say much, I just asked questions. I wanted to learn about the Hajj and what was it about. And then he turned to me and he said, uh, I got a question for you. He said, well, take a look at the United States. Cut off the West Coast, cut off the East Coast. That's where the crazies live. But in the center, there's something else that goes on. I watch their behavior. I see what goes on and why are they different. In Islam, we try to get people to live that way, and we're not. So we talked about the culture in the Midwest. We could have talked about it in the other places, but Razak didn't want to go there. And we talked about the importance of Christianity. He listened. And then he said, I've noticed one thing about you, Sig. In the mornings, on Sunday mornings, I think you're the only one that gets up and goes to church. I hear all these other people talking about being Christian, and I don't see them getting up until about 9 o'clock in the morning. I didn't say anything. And I said, you know, maybe, Rasak, you ought to come to church with me. See what we're doing over there. At least you get an idea. He thought it would be a good idea, but in the end, it was a little too difficult to, to take up the offer. 
Abdul Razak Dawood, about two months after the course was completed, became the Minister of Commerce for Pakistan and a special executive and aide to General Musharraf. What did I learn? It's important to listen, to ask questions, and build trust. And remember, authenticity opens doors. Well, having said that, I'd like to have three items I'd like to talk about. And first is a little bit of biblical background, and then two points that will follow. This will be very quick. One, if you took at the, take a look at the arc of the scriptures, old and new, there is something in common. And that is the issue of the kingdom of God, both in the old and in the new. And it becomes very clear that our God, the God, is the God of history from the very beginning of time until eternity. God is the God of history. And then add to that one other item. When we pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Now listen carefully. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. What did I say? Your kingdom come on earth as well in heaven. There's almost a sense that God's desire is that heaven and earth, the idea of a kingdom, is shared in both. And together here on earth, there is to be a taste and a sense of that in a powerful way. And so it is that we come to the second point I'd like to make, and it comes from Genesis 1. You know the words. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply till the earth, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on earth. There is a sense that as heaven and earth and the kingdom, God is in the center of it. And who does he put there to be him in the center? You and me, humankind, made in his image to care for and help foster, to usher in the kingdom of God in our world today. It's a little bit different story than we often hear. And so it's with that I have two points I'd like to make. First, discipleship begins with you. Hearing God's call to be his real presence in the world. Hearing God's call to be his real presence in the world. Listen to these words from Colossians and from Philippians. He, from Paul, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and in earth. So if there are, is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Jesus is meant to be more than simply an example for us. He desires, through the work of his Holy Spirit, to be in, with, and under us, to be a real presence working through us to facilitate the kingdom of God. Listen again. He, it is as though as we work, he's personally working through us and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what does it mean? And how do you translate that into our lives? Again, we'll go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 11. 
God says, and I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. He's talking not about a set of rules, but what I would suggest, a set of virtues. We don't talk much about virtues today, but virtues are timeless and transcendent from the very beginning of time on to eternity. And the virtues that I'm talking about are the virtues that come from Jesus himself and his behaviors. I would suggest that there are five, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each of them, but I'll share the five. The first is love, willing to serve others before self, willing to say no when you must, can be tough in tough situations, seek to inspire other people, care for them, build the capacity in other people, display empathy and compassion, that's love. The second is integrity, doing what you say, they match not only at home, at work, and out in public. And oftentimes people say one thing and then you watch them do something else. That's not integrity. And today, integrity is in short supply in a lot of places. So we have love, integrity. The third is truth. Able to distinguish between what is right and wrong. Able to really ask yourselves, who am I really? Take away that which covers my eyes and my life and let me see who I really am. And what about the world around us? To be honest about what it is. And aware who I am and who I am not. Love, integrity, truth. The third is excellence. Now excellence gets passed around in all sorts of ways, almost like organic. And I would say that Excellence is always striving to grow, to learn, to improve. It's always seeking to live the life that Christ has called us to live. It sets high standards. It holds people accountable. Excellence. And then the last, love, integrity, truth, excellence, and his relationships. And relationships we need to begin to recognize is all about people and not about things. And we know and desire to get to know people and get to know and build trust. Relationships are critical. But having said that, there's one more, and that's the issue of courage. C.S. Lewis says this, courage is not simply one of the virtues but the form every virtue takes at its testing point, something that we face day in and day out. Not once, but over the course of our life as we bring those virtues to, to life, as we bring Christ into the world. Now, another brief story. At the end of every academic year at the Naval Academy, those who are graduating will go to different service groups, some to submarines, surface warfare, um, aviation, some specialties, and then the Marine Corps. 30% of the graduates of the Navy go to the Marine Corps. And after, uh, just shortly before graduation, they have dinners for each of those groups. There are formal dinners, and very senior people from the academy and from Washington, D.C. come to welcome them and to speak to them. And on one night, there was a three-star general who was with the Marine Corps for dinner, and he, his speech was short but to the point. And he said, gentlemen and ladies, he said, we have put a lot of time into you to grow, to learn, to prepare you for what is to come. And we celebrate that, and we celebrate your being here tonight. But once you raise your right hand, to become an officer in the Marine Corps, all that changes because it's no longer about you, it's about love. You are to love your fellow Marines, the one to the right of you and to the left of you. Even if it means dying for them, you need to love your people. 
That's the foundation of who we are. Well, if, and then you know the comment of the Marines, Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And so when you hear that story, I think you begin to recognize that there is a moral compass, a moral foundation, and we are to be able to trust and work on that. There is power, transforming power, when Jesus is working through us. Then I have these two sets of ominous words that trouble me every day, and I hope they will for you too. The first is a statement made by Donna Canning. She was a member of Upper Arlington Lutheran Church where I came from to come to Good Shepherd. And before I left, she said this, Sig, I want you to remember this. Stay close to the Lord. The second person is Marilyn Andrus. She's a woman's Bible study leader in Annapolis. And Martha, my wife, um, attended many of her Bible studies. And before every Bible study, she would pray to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to talk about or say in this Bible study? And if you tell me nothing, I say nothing. And then this came on her heart. And she said, say it everywhere you go. Jesus is speaking. Stay close to me or you won't make it. Stay close to me or you won't make it. Those are powerful words. My first point, discipleship first begins with you. It's hearing God's call to be his what? Real presence in the world. Now, my second point. Discipleship is not about you. It's God's call to be authentic. Your character matters. One more brief story. This is about Pakistan, not about Razak. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Pakistan on a special mission to look at their nuclear power plants. There's a lot that goes around about this story. I'll set that aside. And so I visited their power plant in the south of Pakistan, and then I was taken up into the north um, to Chasma with a plant that was being built by the Pakistanis and the Chinese, and I met with key leaders both from China and from Pakistan. And along the way from South Pakistan to North Pakistan, I met a lot of people, interacted with a lot of people, and my host had said, I'll invite you, but I'll invite you when I think it's safe. And he declared that it was safe, though I had a dozen soldiers with me wherever I went. And if I knew there was a firefight, whoever it was would be dead, but so would I. But anyway, I got back, and we came back down to the capital of uh, Pakistan, and I met with the head of the uh, Pakistani nuclear program. We talked for a while, and he said this, my people have been watching you, and I've been getting reports about you wherever you have been, and from this one other individual who has gotten to know you. I've heard a lot about you. We talked about the visit. He got up, shook my hand, and I was getting ready to leave, and he said, sing, come back. I'd like you here about 6 o'clock tonight. Come alone. I'll send a driver and pick you up, and I want to talk with you. I didn't know what that was about, so at the point in time, I went back to his office, and he sat down, and he said, Sig, I want to talk a little more seriously and deeply. And we talked about a number of things, which I can't talk about, and he said, you know, I know you don't represent the United States government, you're here representing the commercial nuclear world. And he said, I have heard enough. I have watched you. I've heard reports from you. I know I can trust you, and you'll be honest with me. Put out his hand, shook my hand, and he said, let's be friends. We went downstairs, and there was a dinner for this new relationship. What came out of it was Pakistan opening up its plans for inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency. What did you hear in that story? There's a lot about behaviors. 
And I think that as we uh, look at the five virtues that I've talked about, they are cornerstones for building trust and opening the door to deeper conversation and letting God work in ways that will astonish everyone. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Far too many people today, including those who proclaim they're a Christian, believe character is not important. No wonder we've lost our voice in the world today. People are watching us, and we cannot proclaim one thing and behave differently. Character matters. Virtues matter. Behaviors matter. Now, you may say, Sig, I'm only human. I can't do all that. You're asking the impossible. You'll have doubts. You'll be in difficult circumstances. You'll make mistakes. You'll fall short of the mark. You'll feel incapable. You'll feel lost. But I would say, remember who walks with you through it all. Discipleship is a journey. It's a growing process over a period of time. And the more we learn, the more we experience, the better we can serve. Now you may ask, is there anything that I can do to help this process? Well, there are. I'll give some simple items for you. One, stay close to Jesus. Without that, we are untethered, and who knows what can happen. And then I would suggest the following. Daily, look in the mirror. Go to bed at night, and what do you see? And then I'd ask some questions about yourself. Did I treat others like they were created and made in the image of God? Did I make people feel valued today? Did I listen to my wife or my husband? Did I listen to my kids, my friends, my work colleagues, and seek to better understand them? And conclude that view in the mirror with this prayer. Lord, help me. Grant me the courage to be a better representative of you tomorrow. As Luther often talked about, we're called to die daily to ourselves and rise to our newness in Christ. Now, back to the initial question. What does it mean to be a disciple today? I'll say basically three things. One, we follow Jesus. We stay close. Two, we serve as his real presence in the world. And three, we're known by our character, our humility, and our generosity. And so I'll close with the concluding part of our text for the day. Again, from John 12, Jesus is speaking. And when I am lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. And then some said, how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtakes you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become the sons of light. Discipleship first begins with you, but is about your and his real presence in the world around us. Be courageous. And with that, I'll close in prayer, and I would like us to pray this together. Please stand. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.